We're going to be in Job chapters 25 through 28 tonight, as Doug so enthusiastically mentioned. But don't panic, because a few of these chapters are kind of short. So we'll get through, and we'll have plenty of time for our uh, communion as well tonight. But we're continuing on this back-and-forth conversation between Job and his supposed friends, these three men that uh, came to comfort Job initially, but then as they started to uh, notice, or at least try to evaluate why this all happened, they quickly came to the conclusion that Job must be suffering all of these things because there was some kind of sin or unrighteousness in his life. And so they began to really systematically between the three of them point a, a finger at Job and, and talk to Job a lot about what God does with the wicked, sort of inferring that uh, this was Job's plight because all he needs to do is repent, turn from these things, and God would restore him. God would bring all of that back. And uh, we see Job's constant reply to them being that he does not sense any sin in his life for which this is happening. Not that he's claiming to be sinless, but that he is claiming to be, in a sense, upright. And that there wasn't anything or any reason in terms of sin that Job can find within his heart that would cause this. There had to be or has to be another reason. And Job's desire is to be able to come to God and present his case. Time and time again, we see him asking of the Lord, if, if you would but come to me, if I, if I could find you, if I can just state to you my reasons, my side of it, or at the very least, Lord, tell me what I'm accused of. Tell me what I'm being convicted of, and I'll gladly take that punishment. But sort of having this in between, and as we noted, you know, Job suffered greatly. Uh, we talked this morning about, about suffering and, and the fellowship of, of suffering that we have in Jesus Christ, and even as we heard from Nagme Abedini and, and what she's gone through in the last three years or so with her husband there in this Iranian prison. Am amazing. It's tremendous to even comprehend all of that. But she would attest, I think, to the same thing. She's never been closer to the Lord than through all of this. And we can all attest of those times when hardship has come and it's done nothing but, but really draw us a lot closer to God. Uh, hopefully it, will, it does, because when those kind of trials come our way, we always have a choice, don't we? We're either going to get better or we'll get bitter. And uh, our hope is that, that that betterness of God's peace would just reign in our hearts and we would trust Him for the outcome, whatever it might be. So we've been learning as we've gone through this book two things. One, how we should face trials ourselves, and Job being that example. He doesn't always get it really right, but for the most part, he does. And also, how we should treat others or take others through their trials when they're experiencing them. And so far, we've got nothing but negative reinforcement from these three friends of what not to do. Well, tonight, we're going to finish up round three. There's been three rounds of all three friends now speaking to Job, although this is now Bildad, the second person. We're not going to hear from Zophar again. Not so far, at least. You could just sense it was coming, huh? <laughs> what else are you going to do with these names? Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz. But Bildad is going to speak, and this is going to be the last that we hear uh, in terms of argument from these three friends. Uh, it's rather disturbing to see how Job's three friends speak so knowingly about God when in the end, as we'll discover, uh, we will get there, trust me, um, that God reveals that, that it's really them that didn't know what they were talking about. And isn't that true? Far too often you come across people, don't you, who know just a little bit about God but feel like they're an instant authority? And, and uh, especially when, you know, the whole God of love thing. Well, God, a God of love wouldn't do that sort of thing when it comes to trials, which was their problem too. If Job indeed was, a, was righteous, there's no way that God would punish him or bring these trials. Well, we know the true story. It's interesting that Bildad's speech is the shortest in the book, and it's in response to Job's own description of the wicked and how they treat the poor, which we studied last week, along with his own personal curse on them. We finished off with that. 
But Bildad is now going to focus on God's power for just a quick six verses, as you probably already noticed. And this, like I said, is going to be the last argument we hear from the traumatic trio as they sit there with Job. So let's go ahead and jump right in and hear what Bildad has to say about God's power and, and in, in that sense, how then can man be righteous? Verse 1 of chapter 25, Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, Dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace his high places. Is there any number to his armies upon whom does his light not rise? So first Bildad is kind of showing or giving a, a, a picture here of God's power. And it's interesting that God's power is inherent to his nature. And in a sense, like I've said before, these guys are not necessarily wrong in what they're saying. It's just that they're pointing it at the wrong person or that they're emphasizing it to the wrong conclusion. So here again, this, these are facts. Dominion and fear belong to the Lord. He makes peace in his high places where he chooses. Is there any number to his armies upon whom does his light not rise? So God is everywhere, he's saying. The armies of the Lord, the hosts of the Lord are immense. His angels are at his command and ready to obey his will. He has everything under control. He sees what's going on in all places. And he brings his peace as he sees fit. He has dominion or the fear of him. Another word of saying that is awe. As he reigns sovereignly in heaven. So there's the power of God. But then he finishes off his little argument here with the justice of God. Or God's justice. Verse 4. How then can man be righteous before God? Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? Like I said before, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Right? Thank you, Bildad, for your words of comfort and kindness. How much less a man who is a maggot? I don't know if you've ever been called a maggot before. Uh, unless, yeah, if you're in the, I guess if you're in the Marines, that's, that's true. That's probably one of the, something you hear a lot as you begin. Um, <laughs> but to be called this, the lowest of all creatures, and uh, the son of man who is a worm. Now, God's justice is manifested in, in the outworkings of it through his holy nature. As it says in 1 John 1 verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So there's no argument here with Bildad about the terms of God's justice. You know, you're right. How can man be righteous before God? How can he be pure? Who is born of woman? Because the fact of the matter is, man is born of woman and he's born in a sinful nature. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. But we have to keep in mind that these guys are viewing all of this from an Old Testament perspective. And in that Old Testament sense, it's a very accurate question. How can a man be righteous before God? Because we're born in sin. We're born in impurity. And if the things, verse 5, that God created apart from the earth, we can see that the earth is cursed. We can see that everything around us kind of has that tinge or that taint of sin. But if the stuff removed from the earth, even the moon, which is brilliant and it shines so faithfully every night, and the stars which are hung in heaven, if they're not pure in God's sight, if they're not enough, then how much less a man who is but like the lowest, the, the, the larvae of the fly, just kind of squirming around on its belly there, or the worm. How can we have any righteousness before God? You know, in the east, the, the moon and the stars shine brilliantly. I, I've, I've seen the, the skies up in the eastern part of our hemisphere, and it is, it is amazing. It's brilliant there. I think we probably have with the same kind of brilliance if we just shut the lights off for five minutes. You'd probably be amazed how many stars you could see. As a matter of fact, if you haven't ever done it, get out to the desert sometime during a new moon, right? That's when the moon is dark so that it won't light its brilliance and kind of 
overpower the stars. And when the sky is absolutely dark like that, look up at the stars. And the amazing thing is, as your eyes adjust, you'll see layer upon layer upon layer of just millions and billions of stars. It's, it's amazing, beautiful. And we can get there. It's, it's a drive, and you can see it. But in your backyard, probably not. But the brilliance of the stars that shine and even those are not good enough, as Bildad says. And, and in a sense, he's right. So, God's power, God's justice, how can man be righteous before the Lord? And he stops there. It's kind of like really nothing else to say. And here's God's majesty, Job. Here's his power. Here's his justice. Now, stand up against that, if you will. Well, Job answers in an interesting way. Because Job begins by acknowledging God's power. He doesn't argue with Bildad here. He simply comes right alongside and kind of gives his own um, spin on it. In chapter 26, verse 1, But Job answered and said, first of all, he gives a little rebuke to Bildad, How have you helped him who is without power? How have you saved the arm who has, that has no strength? How have you counseled the one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared sound advice to many? To whom have you uttered words? And to whose spirit came and whose spirit came from you? So before Job can get into his actual answer, he takes just a few verses here, just a moment. And it, notice this is all in verse. So it's given poetically. And maybe my imagination stretches a little too far on this one, but maybe these guys sung this to each other. That would be put a whole new spin on the entire book of Job, wouldn't it? If they're kind of cantering this back and forth. Like, have you helped him who is without power? <laughs> have you saved him who has no strength? Um, all right, we'll leave that aside. Maybe that doesn't work. But this given in verse, this given sort of in this idea of, 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 of poetically stating, and it's true that a lot of people in those days spoke this way. They spoke very properly, and they really did, in a sense, speak in verse. So Job takes these first four verses, or actually three, and once again just says, you know, build out, here's the thing, you've been no help to me at all. I have been pleading to hear from God. And if you literally were speaking for him, if his heart was in your heart and you were speaking for him, I'd listen because I want to hear. And I don't need to hear directly from God. I, I could certainly take counsel from fellow man if it's coming from the Lord. But it's so obvious that what you're saying isn't because you guys are just so stuck on this idea that it's because of my sin and that my integrity is tainted in some way. He would have listened. He would have accepted it. Well, now he goes on to extol the greatness of God. And in, in, in the next 5 through 13, uh, Job literally lays out for himself the greatness of God. Verse 5, the dead tremble, and those under the waters and those inhabiting them, Sheol is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. First, he mentions that God sees everything, even the realm of the dead. Even there where we think once we've breathed our last, in the Old Testament sense, that we've gone to Sheol, that we've gone to the grave, that God no longer sees us or that he no longer has an awareness of us. But Job is saying here, no, absolutely he does. And it's interesting, he uses three different words here. He says those under the water, those, in other words, those that have drowned and are there in the depths, or those in Sheol, those who have died of some sort of cause by which they were buried in the earth, and destruction, which is that last one, which kind of gives that indication of those people that were neither drowned nor buried, but somehow were destroyed, maybe by fire, or, or just obliterated in some way. He gives all three of these to kind of let us know that, listen, God sees it, and even those places tremble. They're naked before him. God is totally aware. And destruction has no covering. It, it can't shy away from the presence of God because God has power in the heavens. Verse 7, he stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. 
He binds up the water in, the, in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. So first he begins by describing the heavens, the heavenlies, that which is over us. And God has power over that. I, I think that Job shows some great scientific awareness if you think about it here. Uh, look at the second half of verse 7. He hangs the earth on nothing. Think of, now Job lived in the time of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, right? During the time of the patriarchs. And a lot of the stuff that was going around then, and certainly a lot later than that, when you even get to the Dark Ages and some, somewhere around the beginning of the Renaissance where we got guys like Galileo that are finally looking into telescopes and deciding, you know, maybe the earth isn't flat. Maybe that, that part of the ocean that you see that just kind of disappears into nothing isn't the edge. But maybe it continues. Maybe it's a sphere. Well, here we have Job saying, well, God simply hangs the earth right there in space. He hangs it on nothing. He had an awareness that the earth, as, as this, this ball, like he saw the sun, like he saw the moon, God's just somehow suspended there in space. He has, he has a great awareness. These, these guys were sharp. They were smart. I think we'd be amazed as to how much they understood. So not only that, but God controls the clouds. He controls the rain. All of that is in his, and under his care. But not only in the heavens, he has power on the earth as well. Verse 10, he drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters and at the boundary of light and darkness. The pillars of heaven trembled and they are astonished as his, at his rebuke. So not only the heavens, but the earth. Job praises God for marking the horizon. That, again, the poetic thing might throw us off. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters. What Job is saying is that God makes this, this, this sphere that we're aware of and he separates the one from the other, the land from the sea. And right there at the horizon, right there as far as we can see is where God has the sun rise. And if you turn around long enough, you'll be able to watch it set as well from the west to the east. Oh, east to west, huh? I thought someone would correct me. <laughs> You're not awake, are you? He's grateful for God's ability to do that, and he's thankful that he did. The boundary of light and darkness as the sun goes down uh, there in the horizon. And it's interesting, these pillars of heaven. Now, again, you think he might be talking about heaven, but this phrase, pillars of heaven that tremble, was an ancient reference to mountains. The mountains that sat there on the earth. It was a poetic term that referred to him. And here's why. Because if you think about it, it's called pillars, right? What is suspended between mountains? Well, there's the earth on the bottom and there's the heavens on the top. So they're like, in their perspective, these pillars that held the two apart. And yet even these great mountains, these pillars of heaven, tremble at the voice and at the sight of God. And they're astonished at his rebuke. And then the song of praise finishes by cent centering on God's power in the waters. Verse 12. And he stirs up the sea with his power, and by his understanding he breaks up the storm. By his spirit he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. So again, now he turns his attention to the waters. He's Begins in the heavens, the skies. Then he talks about the earth, the horizon, the sun setting and rising. And, and what about this vast amount of water that we are surrounded by? Is that so, somehow not in God's understanding, not away from God's gaze? No, absolutely. He sees it all. He has power with the sea. And he breaks up the storms by his understanding. In other words, just with a thought, God can bring a storm to the seas or he can break it up. And have the clouds just separate. We certainly saw that, didn't we, when we studied through the book of Jonah. Where as a calm trip suddenly turned into turmoil as God sent a storm to get Jonah's attention. And as, as we learned, he was thrown into the midst of it. And as soon as Jonah was thrown overboard, the storm ceased. It stopped. 
God has that ability. Start and stop the storms. He watches over it all. And he even has control of the sea creatures. That's the reference to this serpent here at the end of verse 13. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. In other words, those, those sea creatures of the great, God, God has, he controls, he knows them. He watches over them. And then he finishes this little discourse in verse 14 uh, with, in a sense, a bit of a rebuke to his friends. Indeed, verse 14, these are the mere edges of his ways. And how small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand it? In all this description that Job gives of God and the greatness that he has in stretching out the heavens, in, in watching over the earth, in setting the horizons, in determining the darkness and the light, and not only having the, the pillars of heaven, the mountains tremble at his voice, but watching over the sea and bringing the storms. And yet, the conclusion Job comes up with is, this is just the mere edges of his ways. You see, this was a rebuke to his three friends because these friends already knew of God's handiwork in nature, and because they knew of it, they had determined from that 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 gave them the authority by which to speak to Job for God. Oh, we understand God's nature. We know all about how he created everything. So that's the premise that we're going on. But Job is claiming just the opposite. He's saying what we see of God in creation is just the fringes of his ways. And what we hear, just a whisper of his power. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to stand at the bottom of a waterfall. I'm talking about a big one. Like, say, Yosemite Falls when it's in its full or, or Niagara, or, or one of those, where you just hear it crashing on the rocks, or even uh, being out at the ocean when there's been that, that, that amazing surf that we've had uh, from some of the hurricanes down in Mexico. If you had a chance to go and just listen, you hear that, that pounding, that thundering, and, and it, it really kind of puts you in your place, doesn't it? I mean, it's so powerful and majestic. And Job is saying, yeah, but that's just a whisper of God's power. That's just a mere little fringe, an edge. Just the edge of the paper <laughs> of what God is and who he is. So then Job, with having confirmed, in a sense, God's majesty and his power and how frail man is in respect to that, he now is going to raise his right hand, as it were, and, in a sense, make an oath and once again proclaim his integrity. Here in chapter 27, moreover, verse 1, Job continued his discourse and he said, and, and in a sense here he raises his right hand and says, As God lives, who has taken away my justice and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say, you are right, my friends. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. So Job starts again by proclaiming his integrity, but now he's doing it by oath, as God lives. Now, this phrase, as God lives, was a pretty serious matter. Because basically what Job was doing is he's inviting God to kill him if he wasn't telling the truth. As God lives. In other words, if these next things that I say, if this commitment that I'm about to make is not true, then I invite the Lord to strike me dead. As God lives. We loosely use a similar phrase, don't we? Swear to God. Right? And usually we're saying that when we think that the look we see on somebody else's face is they don't believe what we're saying. Oh, no, 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 I swear to God, it's the truth. But I don't think that we intend the same end when we say that. I don't think we mean, that, well, hey, you know, if I'm making a mistake here or lying, I hope God strikes me dead. 
But that's what Job meant by saying this. And look at what he commits to. Even though he's saying, listen, even though God has taken away my justice, even though he has made my soul bitter with all of these trials that I'm going through that I don't understand, here is my commitment. And, and I love this. Look at what Job is committing to. This, verses 3 through 6, I, I would mark that down and, and maybe separate it and write it for yourself. Let this be a commitment for yourselves. As long as breath is in me, as, as God's breath is in my nostrils, I'm not going to speak wickedness. My tongue won't under deceit. And far be it from me to agree with those that, that are lying against me, that to say they're right till I die, I'm going to hang on to or not put away my integrity. And this righteousness that is within my heart, I hold fast to in every way. Job is declaring his innocence and once again, his integrity. We use that word a lot, integrity. Let me give you a real quick definition of what in integrity is. Your integrity is who you are when nobody's watching. Who you are when nobody's watching. That's your integrity. And if that is upright, if that is pleasing to God, then your integrity holds fast. But if as soon as you get off by yourself and you think, well, no one's watching anyway and who's it going to hurt? Then your integrity is in jeopardy, to say the least. Well, Job is standing on his integrity. He is not going to lie just to please his friends. He's also not going to bribe God into restoring his fortune. You see, Job had to live with his own conscience. He knew what was going on inside his heart as best he could understand it, and he was going to stand on that, no matter what his friends said or what God did to him, what God allowed in his life. He was going to stand fast. Well, Job was not only claiming his own innocence, but now he's also going to call down the wrath of God on all of his enemies. Verse 7, continuing in his oath, his hand still raised, if you will, May my enemies be like the wicked, and he who rises up against me be like the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much, if God takes away his life? Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? Job is here speaking kind of, in a sense, a, 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 a curse of the wrath of God upon his enemies. Well, who are his enemies? Don't have to look too far. They're sitting right across the ash heap from him. These friends that supposedly were there to help. But now, I'm sure that by this point, a crowd had gathered. I'm sure some people had walked by and said, gosh, Job's out there with some friends, and you should hear the conversation that's going back and forth. And maybe more and more folks have gathered and some, I'm sure, agreed with the three caballeros, with Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. And so they too were under that category of being enemies of Job. Now, his words might sound cruel here, but remember, he's living even before the Mosaic Law. He doesn't have the benefit of God's mercy in the sacrificial system. So he's calling down the wrath of God. But you know the reality is that in the sight of God, Job was right. These are his enemies because they are speaking against him and Job had done nothing wrong. Remember all the way back to chapter 1, verse 2 it says, or actually chapter 1 uh, in verse 8, God saying to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God, and shuns evil. And again in chapter 2, verse 3, God again saying to Satan himself, the Lord saying to him, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, blameless and, an, an, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Job was right. And his integrity was sure, and the things that he was saying, in a great sense, were not that far off. You see, Job's enemies had said that he was suffering because of sin, but you know, there are those times when you do suffer because of someone else's sin. I think of Joseph. He suffered greatly because of his brother's sin. We're about ready to 
celebrate Good Friday. Jesus did all of his suffering because of someone else's sin. Yours and mine. Without doubt. And Jesus gave his life willingly. As a matter of fact, 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, just, the just for the unjust, that he might bring to us God, or bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit. That is the hope that we have being made alive in the Spirit because Christ willingly suffered. Well, after bringing this request of God's wrath upon his en enemies, Job finishes out this chapter with a thought. He wants to teach a lesson. And in verse 11, he even says that, I will teach you about the hand of God. What is with the Almighty I will not conceal? Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? <laughs> I love this. It's like, again, we see the heart of Job. And, and, and catch this. He is concerned for these guys. Yeah, they are his enemies. Yeah, he hopes for God's wrath. But it, as soon as he says it, it's like he catches himself and thinks, oh, man. Yeah, these guys are destined for destruction if they don't get it together. And so again, he's, he's saying, listen, guys, I'm going to teach you. I want to teach you about the hand of God. I'm not going to conceal a thing about the Almighty. You've seen these things for yourselves. Then why are you, you continuing to walk in this, in this nonsense, this complete nonsense? Please, please turn. You're telling me I need to repent. I'm, I'm saying to you, you need to as well. He's once again warning his accusers. He's laying out how God is going to judge the wicked. And beginning in verse 13, we see an interesting thing that Job does in this description that he's going to give many of the images that his friends had used to accuse him. He is now going to bring out and show his friends that they need to be careful lest they be judged by their own judgment. Let's read through it beginning at verse 13. This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword. In other words, he'll gain a lot of kids, but only to be killed. If his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread, those who survive him shall be, bur shall be buried in death, and their widows shall not weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it, and the innocent will divide the silver. In other words, he can hoard all he wants the day he dies someone else is going to just take it verse 18 he builds his house like a moth and the booth like a booth which the watchman makes in other words these homes they may look majestic and mighty but they're going to collapse just like the cocoon of a moth or or like the temporary um, tent of a watchman verse 19 the rich man will lie down and will not be gathered up his eyes he, he opens his eyes and he is no more. Terror overtakes him like a flood. A tempest steals him away in the night. The east wind carries him away and he is gone and it sweeps him out of its place. It hurls him, uh, it hurls against him and does not spare. He flees desperately from its power. Men shall clap their hands at him. In other words, rejoice and they shall hiss him out of his place. In other words, they'll, they'll be glad when he's finally gone, when destruction has finally come to him. Well, again, this, this scathing thing, but all of these components that Job uses, his friends have thrown at him at some point. And what is Job's point here? Again, he's trying to tell his friends, be careful lest you be judged by the very judgments that you are throwing out, that you are pushing out to others. Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount, did he not? In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1 and 2, Judge not that you may not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The Bible has several examples of that. I just thought of a few of them. I'm sure you could think of more. But what about Pharaoh, for example? He decided there were too many Israelites, too many Jewish babies, so he commanded that they be thrown into the Nile and drown. Isn't it ironic? How did Pharaoh die? He drowned. Him and his entire army in the Red Sea. 
So from the waters of the Nile where the Jewish boys were drowned to the roaring ocean of the Red Sea where Pharaoh was drowned. What about Haman? You remember him? In the book of Esther, we st studied through that together. He so hated Mordecai the Jew and was so convinced that he was going to get condemned that he made a gallows for him. How did Haman die? On those very gallows that he had made. Be careful what judgments you throw out, lest they may become your own judgments. There was a handful of guys that didn't like Daniel very much. They thought they'd come up with a decree and got the king to sign off that no one would bow to anyone but the king for a month, knowing full well that Daniel would continue to pray to his God. And what was the verdict going to be for the guilty? Thrown into the lion's den. How did those guys die? And their wives and kids? The very judgment they had come up with. You can see the heart of Job here as he's saying, Be careful, guys. Be careful. Because these very things that you're judging me may become your own judgments. And we'll see at the end, they actually do. Were it not for Job being allowed to pray for them, they would be doomed. Well, we'll finish out this little discourse with chapter 28. Doing pretty good. Job now seeks God's wisdom. Having, again, in a sense, rebuked Bildad, having spoken of the power and the majesty of God, realizing that his integrity is still holding together, that he's committing to it, that his enemies, may they be cursed, may the wrath of God come upon them, but even if, if it does, let me teach you about what you should do. Because here's the end of the wicked. It's not going to be good for your kids, for you, for your riches. You won't be able to take it with you. Terror is going to overtake you. As a matter of fact, people will be happy when you die. They're going to come and rejoice at your graveside. That's not a pleasant thought at all, is it? And having all of that said, now Job turns to the Lord and he seeks wisdom. He's weary of the platitudes his friends were giving him about wisdom. So now he asks a very interesting question. Look for a minute at verse 12 of chapter 28. It's kind of the key of the whole thing. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Job is going to ask this question, and he's going to give three answers to that question in this chapter. Two are in the negative. The last one is in the positive. The first answer to the question, which is in the negative, is wisdom. You can't mine for it. No matter how dig, 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 dig you dib. <laughs> Just in case you were not paying attention, no matter how deep you dig, you won't find it. Let's, let's travel this through him for these 11 verses. Sure, surely, there is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Man puts an end to darkness. In other words, he goes so deep in and he lights up even the center, the middle of the earth and searches every recess for ore in the darkness and in the shadow of death. Places where the earth can just collapse on him. These brave men go in and they mine for this precious stuff. Verse 4, he breaks open a shaft away from people and in places forgotten by feet. And they hang far away from men. They, they swing to and fro. They go, in other words, they go in places where no one else would dare. As for the earth, from it comes bread. But underneath it is turned up by, as by fire. Its stones are the source of sapphires, and it contains gold dust. That, that path no bird knows, nor has a falcon eye even seen it. The proud lions haven't trod it, have not trodden it, nor have the fierce lions passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint, and he overturns the mountains at the roots. This is the, the, the plight of the miner. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eyes see every precious thing. He dams up the streams from trickling. What is hidden he brings forth to light. And then he says, but where can wisdom be found? So first Job says that you can't even mine for it. You can't dig deep enough. He takes us deep to the earth where these brave men mine for gold, for iron, copper, and precious stones. And it's interesting throughout Scripture that wisdom is very often likened throughout 
uh, by these symbols, by these symbols of, of precious metals and precious stones. Do you remember the, the um, illustration that Paul gave there in 1 Corinthians 3, chapters, uh, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, where he says that, that the opposite is true. You can find things on the surface of the earth, wood, hay, and stubble. Those will burn up quickly. But the stuff that comes from underneath, those are the treasures you need to dig for. It says there, now, if anyone builds on this foundation, in other words, the foundation of the commandment of Christ, with gold, silver, and precious stones, or with wood, hay, and stubble, from each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. All of those things will be put into the fire, and that which burns up, which you can figure out pretty naturally, right? It seems like wood, hay, and stubble is going to go up pretty quick. But things like precious stones and gold and silver, they're going to last into the test of fire. Those are the things that will remain. And, and Paul is using that symbol to say, to say this, this is where our lives need to be. The real treasure is something that you indeed need to dig for. Well, that's the Word of God, is it not? It's God's Word that we need to be willing to dig a, a, into the deep mines to find that precious treasure. How do we do that? It takes careful study and prayer, meditation, and obedience to mine out the treasures of God's Word. And the power of His Holy Spirit who gives us the tools to be able to open God's Word and have it actually speak to us. I don't know if you were ever exposed to the Bible much before you came to Christ, before you were born again. But I... I I was somewhat. I was raised in the church. I had a period of time where I really did my best to, to walk away, run away. And, and in that time, I, I experienced a lot of that, that separation from God's word to where people would quote it and I'd think, yeah, that just doesn't make sense. But man, when I surrendered my life back over to the Lord and, and, and God came and regenerated my heart and I heard those same verses you know, you saw the big sign at the football game. For God so loves the world, he gave his only begotten son. And you look at that and go, whoa. Now I understand. <laughs> because by the Holy Spirit, your heart has been rejuvenated. You now have the tools you need. And the wisdom that can't come from hum human effort, it demands humility and spiritual perception. Well, not only can you not mine for wisdom, but you can't buy it. Verse 12. Verse 12. But where can wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Men does not know its value, nor is it found in the hand of the living. And the deep says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Orpher. And, and, and in precious onks or sapphire, neither gold nor crystal can equal it nor can it be exchanged for jewelry of fine gold. No mention shall be made of quor coral or quartz, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. So you can't dig deep enough for it, this wisdom, and you can't buy it either. Isn't it interesting that our modern society thinks that everything can be obtained or accomplished if you just have enough money? That's sad, isn't it? But that's really the way our society works, our materialistic society. Now, it's good to enjoy the things that money can buy as long as you don't lose the things that money can't buy. Right? Relationships, our standing with God, our integrity. So we can enjoy the things that money can buy as long as we don't lose those things that money can't. That's Sad, that, that imbalance that happens. You know, 1 Timothy 6, 17, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Because, you know, the real problem is that men don't comprehend the price of wisdom, and they think that somehow we can get it cheap. Because we're always looking for a bargain, aren't we? I mean... We are looking for a bargain. We don't want to pay more than we have to. Now that we have online, goodness, you can shop around and always get a better price. Look around. Oh, don't ever go for that first thing you get. 
Look for a better price. Kind of like Mrs. Goldberg, who was shopping there at the produce stand at the, in the little neighborhood, and she asked the uh, vendor there, how much are these oranges? And he said, they're two for a quarter. And she says, well, how much is it for one? And he said, 15 cents. And she said, I'll have the other one. <laughs> it may take you a little while, but... Or like the woman who had stopped by her friend's house who was having a yard sale and uh, said, you know, my husband is going to be very angry that I stopped at this yard sale. And her friend said, well, I don't think he'll be too angry when he sees all the bargains that you're going to walk away with. And she says, yeah, normally that'd be true, but he's at home with a broken leg and he's waiting for me to come take him to the hospital. <laughs> Got to have a bargain. We do think we can buy it, but we can't. Because the negative, you cannot mine for it. Negative, you cannot buy it, but positive, wisdom comes from God. Verse 20. From where does it come then? From where then does wisdom come, and where is its place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of the living and concealed from the birds of the air. Death and destruction say, we have heard a report about it with our ears. So it's like something that's out there that's unattainable. You can look high and low, but you won't find it. Verse 23 is the key. Mark this one. God understands its ways, and he knows its place. For he looks to the end of the earth, and he sees under the whole heavens to establish a weight for the wind and a portion in the waters by measure. And when he made the law for the rain and a path for the thunderbolts, then he saw wisdom and declared it and prepared it. Indeed, he searched it out. So Job is saying here, it's found in God. You want to get wisdom? You need to know God. You want to walk in the path of the wise? You need to walk with the Lord. Because he holds everything. As a matter of fact, just even the pressure of the wind, the measure of the amount of water in the atmosphere, it's all a delicate balance. If that ever goes out of balance, we're in big trouble. And God has the wisdom to hold it all together. Here indeed is the answer. He even controls the rain and guides the storms. And even the lightning, as it says here, the thunderbolts, he makes a path for. Even lightning is not random. It's under God's control. Indeed. And here is the answer. Verse 27 and 28 as we finish. Then he saw wisdom and declared it. He prepared it. Indeed, he searched it out. And to man he said. Now here's where we want to pay attention. Because Job is searching for wisdom. He says we can't buy it. We can't mine for it. God only knows where it is. And here's what God tells us. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. That's the answer. Psalm 111 verse 10 says the same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And good understanding have all those who do his commandments and, pray, and his praise endures forever. So if this is the answer... Verse 12, where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of its understanding? And even the elements, the heights, the depths, they don't see it, they can't find it, but God knows where it is. And this is what the Lord says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Then what is our part to figure out? Our part to figure out is what is the fear of the Lord? Right? Simply that. If that is wisdom, then what is the fear of the Lord? And here it is in a nutshell, brothers and sisters. It is the loving reverence for God, who He is, what He is, what He says, and what He does. That's simply it. This loving reverence for God, who He is, what He says, what He does. You see, when you fear the Lord, you obey His commands, you walk in His ways, and you serve Him. You're loyal to Him, and you give Him your whole heart. See, all of those components are what it is to fear the Lord. It's not to tremble in a corner somewhere. It's to walk forward in your commitment to God in absolute reverence and to basically do what He says. That's it. Love one another. 
Be there for each other. Do what he says. And if you lack wisdom, well, James tells us all we need to do is ask. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I heard it put this way once, and I love this. Wisdom is asking God to give us his perspective. Wisdom is asking God to give us his perspective. In other words, when we lack wisdom, what we're asking is, Lord, help me to see this through your eyes. Help me to see this against your word and everything that you've told us about yourself that I might understand, that I might see it as you do. And if you choose not to show me, then give me the understanding to walk in your ways and to keep my integrity as I move forward. Amen? Well, the next three chapters, Job is, Job is going to review his life. So we'll look at that next week. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, again, this time in your word and ask, Lord, that you would quicken these truths to our hearts. We're so grateful for the book of Job. Lord, even though there are parts that are kind of hard to get through, as we've studied, we've been able to see great enlightenment. And I pray even as we've seen tonight, Lord, walking in your wisdom, where can we attain it? Where can we find it? It only comes from you. And what hope do we have of being wise? By being your child, by walking in your ways, by being obedient to the things that you have called us to. And one area where we can be obedient is to gather around the table that you have set where you ask us to remember. And we're going to take some time as we finish out tonight to celebrate communion together. And as we do so, as we worship, and as the elements are handed out, I ask that all of you here take that moment, that time, as you're worshiping, as you're receiving the cracker and, and the cup of juice, to reflect on your own walk with the Lord. Maybe to ask the Lord to give you wisdom to see and review your own life through His eyes. And take that time to realize what God rescued you from, the pit that He took you out of, the solid ground that He set your feet on. Because the communion table is a place of remembrance where we remember what Jesus did for us but also remember specifically what he did in us. So as you receive the elements tonight, take some time to remember as we worship the Lord together.